Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Better Sex Podcast. This is Jessa, and I'm I'm sort, still sort of giggling. I just, I just had this amazing interview with one of the authors of one of my very favorite books that I use in sex therapy all the time called When Sex Hurts, and Dr. Erwin Goldstein, one of the authors of this, and he runs a sexual health clinic in San Diego. I finally got to talk to him. I wanted to interview him for years because I recommend this book all the time. And the reason I'm giggling, well, first of all, he's a very personable and funny guy and is having a ton of fun. But he also basically quizzed me through the whole podcast. So you're going to get to hear what I know and what I don't about specifically the vestibule and uh, female sexual pain. Anyway, it was fascinating. I got some of the answers right, but I've not had a guest who, uh, who quizzed me through the whole thing. But it's an incredibly informative interview. His book is great. He goes over you know, the most common sources of pain and what to do about this and how really most women can expect complete cure or recovery or at least pain-freeness, lack of pain. Uh, And it's a really, really important topic because as he leads off saying, one third of women, one third will have reported, you know, if they're questioned, report pain in the last month. The numbers are huge. This is so prevalent. And I know this from my own sex therapy practice. It is devastating, right? It is devastating to a person and to their sex life with their, with their partner. It has such a huge impact. And so this is so, so important. And I hope you get a ton out of it. And even if you, you know, you're not in pain right now, your partner's not in pain, you don't know anybody in pain. This is too common to skip this episode. Listen in. It's also really funny and you'll, you'll see how I do. (laughs) I hope you like it. And before we start the show today, it is sponsored by Intimacy with Ease. It's a method to help otherwise happy couples achieve a sex life that is easy and fun for both of them. So you can actually just enjoy your sex life with zero stress. For more information, if you want to watch a brief little training video that's available, all of that, go to intimacywithease.com. So, Dr. G, thank you so much for being on the show. My honor and privilege. Thank you so much for having me. And let's have some fun. Let's teach people stuff. Yeah. I mean, your book is, I recommend it to so many uh, of my clients. So I'm so excited to talk to you about this. And there's so much to cover. We're going to have to kind of, I don't know, there's a lot of ground here. But But we'll do it all. We'll get there. All right. So let's just start with how common is sexual pain for women? Like how prevalent is this issue? It's an epidemic is what it is. Really? It's like a pandemic, I guess. So there are data that would show that men have sexual dysfunction, secondary to pain, something like 2%, maybe 7% of cases. But women, one third of women will report having a bothersome, discomforting sexual pain. So you're looking at one third of women. Over their lifetime or like in any well, one day? Within the last, uh, I think the, the, the time period assessed is within the last month. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. So it's, it's a double whammy. It's an issue of women have pain really commonly. Providers in general don't know how to assess it appropriately. And they're in general saying, oh, you have pain. Here's how I manage it. <laughs> Whereas um, if you had pain in your knee... And you went to an orthopod, he'd say, well, it could be your ligament, it could be your tendon, it could be your bone, it could be your muscle, it could be, let's figure it out. And that's just a knee. (laughs) Yeah. So the provider hasn't become, it's like going to an emergency room with chest pain and you say, okay, I got chest pain. 
they're, they're not going to say, oh, here's how I treat that. Here's an aspirin. Go home. You would never do that. You get an EKG, a chest X-ray. You try to understand the basic premise of why the patient is having that. It could be a dermatologic condition. It could be pneumonia. It could be an esophagitis. I mean, whatever. What, I'm just giving you a differential. So sexual pain has that thing. Then there's the next part of the problem. <laughs> yeah. Women have this huge... You know, one third of women have this, and it bothers their desire, arousal, their orgasm. They're they're wanting to want. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, since men don't experience pain, men can't relate to a woman who has pain, saying, "Oh, honey, I get it. I mean, I have pain too." But they said, "Honey, I don't understand this. You know, my penis may not be so erect. I may have early ejaculation, or..." blah, blah, blah. But I don't understand this pain thing because I've never experienced it in my life. None of my friends have experienced it. So there's this weird disconnect here of the couple, you know, heterosexual, doesn't, obviously it doesn't have to be always heterosexual, but right. in a heterosexual relationship, men just don't get this at all. But even some providers don't even say, hey, here's how I treat pain. Don't some of them say, oh, you got to relax, have a glass of wine. It's all in well, your that's head. That's how they treat it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Because, <laughs> I mean, it's it could be so dismissive, right? Like, I, Well, I mean, you know, honestly, if someone comes in with, I have uh, a bug in my my hair and it's scratching, I'd say, you know, I'm really not that kind of doctor you go to a dermatologist, go to an infectious disease doctor. I mean, th there's this common sense saying, I don't know everything. So if someone says, I have sexual pain, and the doctor says, oh, it just relax, it goes away. The implication to the patient is the doctor knows what they're talking about. Right. And, and it's it, it's what he, and he's listened carefully, and he believes that there's no biologic issue that there's really a uh, background that's you know best managed through mental health professionals but that's not the case the doctor should say gee i'm not an expert in that area i know some gynecologists who are iswish members and blah 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 and they talk about the fabulous teaching that goes on in this society well, you know that kind of thing yeah so it's, it's sad that way i agree yeah, I believe, isn't it usually like six or seven different providers on average that a woman would see before she even gets an accurate diagnosis about what might be causing her pain? Yeah, I just had a woman with uh, in the 20s. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's and you know what's really funny? This woman, you know how she got to me? She listened to a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> see, it's exactly. Oh, there's a physical therapist, Stephanie Prendergast, who put on a podcast on physical therapy. She happened to be listening. Pretty much. She was crying today. Oh, my God. She said, oh, my God. So, you know, in our office, women get to see their anatomy. We show them their clitoris or labia, their vagina. We show them their heart's line, their hymen. Their, we show them their – we show them everything because they're entitled to and they should be empowered by it. She says, I've been to so many providers. No one has ever shown me what's going on. So sad. Yeah, and what persistence to see 20-something doctors. I mean, you know, I, I would imagine plenty and of women give up before that. <laughs> I'll tell her to listen to this podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Before we go into like the various kinds of things that be, could be causing pain and how women might start to get some idea of what's going on for them, how did you get into this? Like, why? how is this your specialty? I don't know that you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I go back to being an electrical biomedical engineer. Okay, so... I don't have the brain of a doctor. I have the brain of an engineer. I need to know what's going on. I have to understand what the H is happening. Why is this patient complaining of it? It makes me crazy when I don't understand something. Whereas my colleagues in medicine don't have that burning desire or need to understand everything. They're, they're just saying, okay, I'll deal with this. If I don't understand it, okay, somebody else might, but I'm going to keep on going. So that's not my my persona. So I started in men's sexual health. And as an engineer, I became fascinated with how a penis <laughs> becomes erect. It right, was, exactly. Talk about engineering. It's crazy <laughs> how something soft could get hard and it wasn't a bone. And then at the sound of anything, it can go back to being soft. It, it was absolutely the most fascinating thing I've ever seen. So I spent 25 years being funded by the NIH to try and figure all the physiology. Another thing that made me crazy was this is in the 1970s, and uh, we didn't know how a penis got an erection. <laughs> I said, wow. wow, we've been studying physiology of the liver and the kidney and the spleen and, and the heart for, for, for decades, centuries. Everybody knows that stuff. How come we don't know 
how genitals work. I was uh, later to find out that in urology, we had a sub-compartment, a subspecialty of urology that dealt with the sexuality of, of men. And I just assumed that that track existed in gynecology. But what I failed to appreciate was because men had, because urologists had a treatment called the penile implant. Right. We were sort of forced to better understand how a penis worked because we had a treatment and we needed to know who was indicated who wasn't. And uh, I became really involved with the physiology and that got us involved with understanding the chemicals involved in erection. I mean, it wasn't until the 1990s till we figured that out how an erection wow. actually, which chemical worked. It was called nitric oxide. It was actually a gas. And our lab published the very, very first paper in 1991 on that. And of course, that led to Viagra, which accentuated the action of nitric oxide. And I was working uh, uh, heavily with the Pfizer group to try and get the required information to the FDA to allow uh, a product to be released, first ever oral pill with safe and effective medicine. So I was the first author of the New England Journal paper, May 14th, 1998. Wow. All the phase two, phase three data were finally published. And it was this momentous, historic thing. And as the corresponding author, <laughs> I was receiving like gazillions of phone calls. <laughs> yeah. So my question to you is, who were the gender calling me? Well, I guess it was women. <laughs> it was. And that was way to my surprise. Uh, yeah. They said, okay, I have an orgasm. I have a libido problem. I have a pain problem. I have a this problem. Uh, I don't have anybody helping me. Is Viagra indicated for me? And I said, oh, no, no. I'm a urologist. I do men's sexual health. Viagra is for men. You need to see your gynecologist. Don't, Dr. Gross, you don't understand. I've been to many gynecologists. They don't deal with this stuff. So I said, oh, <laughs> Wow. If I'm going to be this sexual medicine doctor, I'm going to have to deal with both genders. So yeah. in 1998, we started a female sexual dysfunction fellowship. I started seeing women. I had absolutely no training in this. This was learning on the fly. And we started an international society at that time called the International Society for Study Women Sexual Health, ISWISH. And uh, it's now 1998 to 2021, with us, uh, 23 years or whatever number that is. Yeah. And uh, it's fabulous. And we've really grown the understanding of the various dimensions of female sexual function and dysfunction. And it became very evident that sexual pain was the primary reason patients showed up. I mean, you could fake your desire problem. You could fake your orgasm problem. You could fake your arousal problem. It's really hard to not deal with the pain problem. It's just... Right. It's just really aversive. Right. What are the various categories of pain what, or what are the main ones? Like, Because there's a lot of different causes, right? It's not as simple as one thing causes pain. It's like the knee. It could be your tendon, your muscle, right, your, right, bone, right. your ligaments. Uh, uh, yeah. So, well, I think the best way to answer that is you have a vulva and you could have problems in the vulva. You have a tissue called a vestibule and more than 90% of pain is the vestibule. It's a region that, awkwardly enough, is hardly ever examined by a gynecologist. We call the vestibule the little town in the West. You sort of <laughs> drive through it on your way to the cervix to do a pap smear, and you don't have any memory of going through it. Yet, it's 90% of the pain problem. Well, let me just ask you. How, when You've been to one or two gynecologists. I have. Love. I okay. have. Has anyone ever told you about your urethra or your clitoris or your hymen or your anything in the vestibule area? Probably not. No, I don't think anyone's ever examined your vestibule. The fact of the matter is, you have to do special things to examine a vestibule, and that's the cause of 90% of patient problems, and it's hardly even examined. That's wow. how sad this whole thing is. And you, of course, have a vagina, and you have uh, could have pain in the vagina. But the reality is the vulva and the vagina are, are really protected against pain. The only real time you have pain in the vagina is during menopause. And there are dermatologic conditions that affect the vulva, but the reality is... The pain problem, which is the, the word pain is odinia, the real true pain problem is vestibulodynia. Yet when a doctor talks about pain, they talk about a condition called vulvodynia, which isn't really where the problem is. It's sort All right. Of so just for, for, for the listeners, would you define the vestibule? What is this mysterious, <laughs> this mysterious tissue that's somehow between the vagina and the vulva? What, like what, what comprises the vestibule? All right. Well, I'm going to play a little game with you. We'll, we'll play teaching. <laughs> okay. So you have a mouth. 
You have a nose, you have eyes, you have ears, you have an anus, and they all have skin on the outside and something on the inside that makes that place a special place. So bowel, the bowel contents, mouth, you have saliva contents, ear, you have hearing things, nose, you have smelling things, eyes, you have seeing things, but it's all essentially an outside and an inside. But your vagina has three things. So here's my question to you. I'm putting you on the spot here. Okay. <laughs> Why does the vagina have? A vulva, a vestibule, and a vagina, where the mouth, the eyes, the nose, the anus have two things, an inside and an outside. I don't know, just because women are complicated? No, I... I <laughs> That's I, a good uh, answer. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Well, because the mouth, the anus, the eyes, the nose are the same in the both gender. But the okay. vagina is different from the penis. And the fact of the matter is, everybody starts as a woman. 100% right. of all human beings are women for the first trimester. So something has to be in the woman that allows the male genital to form no normally. Mm -hmm. So guess what that organ is? Uh, the clitoris, right? The vestibule. The uh, vestibule the is vestibule. the structure oh, okay. that allows okay. the male genital to be male. Okay. So it's the missing part, or it's the part that's required in a man to make the urethra of the extended clitoris and extended shaft that, that comes out in the second trimester. Okay. So the male penile urethra, which makes pre-cum or pre-ejaculate in the medical term, is the same organ that makes the pre-cum, pre-ejaculate in a woman when she's sexually raped. So now you know. Okay. And with that piece of information, you could probably assume that since the male penile urethra is highly testosterone dependent, you now have this weird thing of having a woman, everything is estrogen, estrogen, estrogen. But the vestibule is really a testosterone organ. Now, there are other testosterone organs. You mentioned the clitoris, which is a testosterone-based organ. And the woman's prostate, you have a prostate. It's at your bladder neck, and we call it the G-spot in lay term, but it really the, the, the female prostate or the prostate of a woman is uh, testosterone. -dependent. So women with low testosterone, why would a woman have low testosterone who's 16 years old, 17 years old, 15 years old, even now 14 years old? Why would they have low testosterone? I want to say environmental factors, but is that just about menstruation? Would you call would you call a birth control pill an environmental factor? <laughs> well, I mean, man-made. Uh, yeah, because the birth control pill in 100% of cases lowers testosterone in all women users, 100%. And you have something like 20 plus million women using this. So this is a, I guess what you're saying is this is one of the causes of pain? being on the birth control pill? Yes, very much so. And the vestibulodynia that's resultant from not having testosterone, not having the vestibule being able to make lubrication, the glands are unable to shoot out the bacteria because it's not making the, the flushing effect of mucus secretion. The bacteria will live in the gland cause an inflammatory response. And then when the penis has to pass through the vulva, through the vestibule to get into the vagina, it's rubbing against red hot glandular tissue. So that's called hormonally mediated vestibulodynia. <laughs> and it's one of the number one causes of entrance dyspareunia in younger women. Okay. And do you diagnose that with a blood test, testing testosterone? Easy, easy. yes. Yeah. <laughs> testosterone blood test. It's a little more complicated because... Uh, there's a thing called sex. You have to say this with me. Sex. Sex. Hormone. It's a hormone, yes. Binding. Binding. Globulin. Globulin. Okay. So there, there's the acronym is SHBG. The way the birth control pill causes low testosterone is it raises a hepatic or liver-made protein called sex hormone binding globulin, whose job it is to bind testosterone. So all the testosterone that a woman makes is now bound in a protein, so you don't have access to it. So it can't feed the tissue of the vestibule. So this is called free testosterone. And a more accurate form of free testosterone is done on a calculator. So it's called calculated free testosterone. I don't want to make it too complicated, but a blood test that gets you a calculated free testosterone would engage a total testosterone, a sex hormone binding globulin measurement. And we in our clinic measure the end product after all of that called dihydrotestosterone. So we get a gamut of blood tests to form the diagnosis, hormonally immediate. Now, it's more than just a blood test, but a blood test gets you at least starting in this process. Right, right. Does a hormonal mediated vestibulodynia, right? <laughs> Did I get that right? It's perfect. 
Does that happen separate from birth control? Can people have their own hormonal imbalances somehow, or do you mostly see that related well, to birth so control? Women can have hormonally mediated vestibule uh, by birth control pill, and you could take birth control pills because you want contraception. But a lot of doctors prescribe birth control pills for treatment of things like endometriosis, for treatments for polycystic ovary condition, for treatment like uh, perimenopause to, to provide some hormonal milieu. So that's sort of sad. You're going into perimenopause. Your, your, your children have left. You're ready to be alone with your partner. Your doctor is giving you a medicine that makes you have pain <laughs> at the opening to your vagina. So uh, you can also take birth control. You can also take medicine that stops testosterone when you're doing infertility treatments because you have to sort of turn off your ovaries so you can regulate the hormonal status. Uh, you can, uh, acne patients, the, the, they, they, they love birth control products and other products, spironolactone, Accutane, also lower testosterone. Breast cancer patients are given suppressants for ovarian synthesis and on and on. There's a whole bunch of medications that we sadly provide but don't provide information on the sexual consequences. Is the general advice then to somehow supplement the testosterone or is it to try to get off the birth control of the medication if that's medically advisable? Like there's other ways to have contraception or... Yes, and actually uh, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the American Academy of Pediatrics has no longer voicing support for birth control pills as the number one method of contraception. What, what is the number one method of contraception? I'm sort of putting on your spot a whole bunch of times today. Hope you smile through these things. <laughs> I do. I love this. Most people don't do this. So, so. Uh, the number one method in terms of effectiveness? It starts with L the... and ends with C. L and C. And the next initial is A, and the next initial is R. They're called LARCs. L -A -R oh, yeah, yeah. Long-acting, something, contraception. contraception. Of right, right. So like an IUD. An IUD. Yeah. But they also have the elbow things, the uh, next but on implement things. Right, right, right. And progesterone can be considered uh, a LARC. But it, it's uh, they don't they don't affect SHBG. That's the whole blessed benefit to larks. So if a young woman comes in and she's on birth control, it is part who of the pain. pain tr who right. has depression? Who has low libido? Who feels like crap because they're you're going to say switch to an IUD, get off the pill. Uh, well, we're going to have a, a, a well. I mean, you'll have a conversation. But the, but the end conversation would be. By the way, larks are much more reliable in contraception. Since they're long acting, you don't have to do it on a daily basis. If you forget uh, to at noon to take your pill, that's a that, that's a big problem for that. Right. Uh, they have a higher pregnancy rate for control pills. Yeah. Okay. So that's the most common cause of pain, is what at least in young women well, you're saying. Young yeah. Okay. Hey, we're going to just take a short little break here, and I want to let you know about. Intimacy with Ease, the method that helps otherwise happy couples create a sex life that is fun, easy, light for both people. So if you are an otherwise happy couple, if sex is the elephant in the room or sex is the little bit of the challenge for you guys, you may want to check this out. Uh, you can go to intimacywithease.com and you'll see information there. You'll see short videos. You'll have access to a full webinar about it, all kinds of information to let you know if this would be the right thing for you. The older one would be the hormonal challenges of menopause. It's the same context. Testosterone goes really low, roughly around mid-40s. You know, you sort of have two menopauses. Mm -hmm. The first menopause is the testosterone fall, and then the second menopause is the estrogen fall. And as you go through menopause, <laughs> we have to have this conversation. A lot of people say, ah, oh, my hot flashes are over. I don't have menopause anymore. I'm done. <laughs> well, uh, uh, sorry, Mrs. Jones, you have menopause till you die. I'm sorry. Right, right, right. It's about your ovaries working or not. Your ovaries aren't working. So you're not synthesizing critical sex steroid hormone products, progesterone, estradiol, and testosterone. And your tissues will atrophy and you are going to have all different consequences. Oh, but I don't want to take hormones because they're going to cause cancer. But I want to treat my menopause naturally because na menopause is a natural event. So my wife will always say, but if you had cancer, would you treat your cancer naturally? If you had hypertension, would you treat your hypertension naturally? Why are you picking on menopause when we can provide you with safe and effective strategies? 
that give you uh, life quality in terms of intimacy. I mean, you know, gray divorce is a big deal. And men have their Viagras <laughs> and women aren't getting treated for their menopause. That's like, wow, what a setup for the guy saying, okay, she doesn't love me. I'm moving on. You know, they're kind of crazy. So is hormone replacement therapy what you're talking about there? Or, is, or are there more topical options for people? Or Well, is- so in my office, hormone replacement equals five things. So uh, in many offices, hormonal replacement therapy is putting a little pill in your vagina which isn't really hormonal replacement therapy. But uh, so, so we divide menopause into strategies that engage in three systemic treatments. So this is, and we have local treatments. So we'll talk about systemic treatment. So testosterone is not synthesized. Estradiol is not synthesized. And progesterone is not synthesized. So we have strategies using biologically identical, FDA-approved strategies for testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. And when I say FDA approved for testosterone, you have to appreciate that the FDA has still yet to approve a testosterone for women, despite the fact it is a very important sex steroid hormone in their physiology. Yeah. So the only thing we can do is use FDA approved products for men and dose them down to women, which is typically a tenth of a dose. I had a woman today who had birth control pills, hormonally mediated vestibulodynia, saw 10 doctors, was crying because she finally found out what's going on. We She looked at herself because we do a thing called vulvoscopy. She saw all the the the, the redness or in the vesicle, nothing in the vulva, nothing in the vagina. Her uh, sex hormone binding globulin was over 100, supposed to be 25. So she fit the, the hormonally mediated vestibulodynia pattern. But my whole point is uh, we had to treat her with testosterone. And she had acne as a child. So instead of doing a, a tenth of a dose for her, we did a, a 30th of a dose. So she'll take a tube that a man uses on a daily basis. What a woman would typically divide into a tenth of a dose, we made it into a 30th of a dose. So she used a tube a month to avoid acne. So, uh, you know, it's adjustment and all, the, all that stuff. So we give testosterone. We give estradiol, but that's FDA-approved uh, products. There's patches and creams and injections and all that stuff. And then there's progesterone, which is typically a pill, which is micronized progesterone. Now, it, because we only expect women to raise their values a small amount, we have to supplement with topical. So we have products that go into the vagina and products that go onto the, guess which one? V-E-S-T-I-V. <laughs> the vestibule. There yes. you go. Good right. job. Right, so right, it's right. It's testosterone estrogen cream that's on the vestibule. Now, with the five products, I'll do valvoscopy on these women, and I'll take their red, irritated, pallor, atrophy tissue. We watch it get normal. It's very cool. Wow. Okay. So, what other? What are some of the other most common causes of pain? Well, so there's dermatologic causes. Okay. A very common one is called lichen sclerosis. It's an autoimmune fibrotic condition. Uh, of the tissue, typically uh, vulvar and vestibular. It never goes into the hymen, so it's never in the vagina. Lichen sclerosis has a sort of a figure eight shaped, and it looks like white, crinkly, uh, cigarette-like paper. It can engulf the clitoris and and, uh, close it to the hood. It can go around the perianal area, goes around the labia, causing the labia to resorb. Uh, It gets itchy and painful. And uh, a biopsy is preferred so they can actually get a tissue. And we have a really nice uh, treatment with a very ultra potent steroid called uh, clobetazole. And it's used as an ointment and you have to rub it in because you've got to get through the thickness of the thing, take a bath before. We have all these strategies to do. If anyone wants any of this information, I could <laughs> add, add to their knowledge base. Right. And then there's other uh, dermatologic conditions. Lichen planus is a, a sad autoimmune condition with uh, where the skin surface is eroded, gone. It's ulcers. And oh. you, see, you actually see deeper tissues. Pretty sad. And then there's inflammatory conditions, the candidiasis, other infections, disquamative inflammatory vaginitis, all these kinds of things. And then there's, of course, the pelvic floor. We have a million fabulous pelvic floor physical therapists who do yeah. amazing work in the pelvic floor. So there's a condition when the pelvic floor is too tight and they can relax it with appropriate treatments. Right. And then there's other conditions called neuroproliferative vestibulodynia regions. And that's that's sort of interesting. So if someone has a lifelong, uh, we call it congenital neuroproliferative, so lifelong pain. So this woman 
well, nothing happens till the menses start, and then they try to put a tampon, and they say, oops, that, how does that go in? That yeah. really hurts. And then they try again and again, they can't do it, so they wear pads, and then sometime they need a pap smear, and then the doctor has to put a speculum and says, whoa, the speculum is crazy. And then they are in college, and now they they start to become sexual, and then someone puts something inside, and they scream. So they've essentially never had a pain-free penetration episode. Yeah. So if you touch their belly button with your finger or a Q-tip, they jump. There's a, a super sensitivity to the belly button called umbilical hypersensitivity huh. in this population. And it's basically a disorder of what's called a mast cell, M-A-S-T, mast cell. These are allergy inflammation cells that uh, go into tissues, activate stem cells, and then leave. But for whatever reason, they can't leave this tissue. They constantly come and attach and stay there. And they release as part of their healing, which is what they're supposed to do, but they're supposed to leave, so they don't release it going on. They relieve a thing called nerve growth factor. So guess what happens when you have a million mast cells relieving nerve growth factor? You've got too many nerves, right? Yeah. And that's a big challenge. I'll show yeah. you my hand here. I'll draw a, a, a square here if I could, or a circle would be easier. If I was outside the circle, that tickles. If I go into the circle where I have a million nerves, it feels like broken glass. It feels like burning. It feels like itching. It feels like tearing. It, all the, the weird feelings that you have are just because there's too many nerves. And then you go back to the area of normality and it tickles again. So it's this uh, region of uh, way too many nerves. So uh, now there is a an acquired form. So these are people who could put a tap on. These are people who could have a speculum exam early. And then I had a woman who didn't like her pubic hair color. So she took a, a hair color thing and put it on, and it just dripped right into the through the labia to the vagina. Oh gosh! And her vestibule became uh, developed an allergic response, and now she developed mast cells they couldn't leave, and then she got the nerves. So there's an acquired form by an allergy. I'm going to ask you this question just to challenge you. Okay. What is the number one medicine used by women that causes them to have this? Uh, uh, acquired neuroproliferative condition. It's a topical medicine that women buy over the counter as much as like uh, Coca Cola's. I would say something like Vagisil. Maybe, but not the answer I was seeking. It's okay. I'll give points for that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. You keep a score for me, right? It's monostat for okay. vaginal okay. yeast infection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's got a medicine that helps the yeast infection, but it's an ointment. So it's got all these weird additives into it. And if you're allergic to all these things that make it creamy, you introduce the same as that woman who dropped the hair color agent in. It causes this horrible allergy. And since the one time monostat is applied for the rest of their lives, they have these too many nerves in the tissue. It's really wow. sad. Wow. Okay. Because I knew there was some correlation with recurring yeast infections with pain too. But are you saying it's more about the monostat than it is about the actual yeast infection? Well, you have to get a good history because uh, some people treat the yeast infections with oral products. So you can't uh, claim a topical allergy. But uh, okay. yeah. Well, I mean, people put a lot of stuff on their vegetable. You got powders and perfumes and yeah. Yeah. Or even just soap, I suppose, could be problematic, right? Yeah, let's argue that that's a contact dermatitis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what's the treatment available for somebody with a nerve proliferation? So uh, we're struggling with that one. Yeah, the, is <laughs> that the, tr like the trickiest do, one? We'd like to do conservative treatments, but the fact of the matter is every time we do a conservative treatment, it's done in the presence of a million mast cells and a million nerves. Yeah. So the, the, the strategy that works the best is to surgically remove the vestibule. Wow. But not everybody likes to have surgery, but, you know, if you're back against the wall and you're 22 years old and you're staring at, I, since I'm 13, I can't use this, this uh, part of my body. So some people actually look forward to the surgery. We have an 80% cure rate, so it's not like it's a low percentage. Okay. Is it, um, I, I mean, I'm just going to ask the question people might be thinking, is that horribly disfiguring? <laughs> oh, Does no, that... completely not. Um, okay. In fact, let's get back to our conversation about the mouth and the anus and the eyes. So the vagina has this vestibule, but it's only truly needed if you're a boy and it needs to work into the, as the male penile urethra. If you as a woman decide you're not going to be a male transgender person, if that's an official no, 
that you don't need your vestibule. So what okay. we do is we attach the vulva to the vagina, making it just like every other orifice on earth. The vagina gets wet with arousal, and there's their lubrication. And the vulva doesn't, and the vagina don't have mast cells and nerves. It's only in that, that crazy vestibule. And you know why the belly button hurts when you have congenital? Because it's the same embryology as the vestibule. Okay. So it has the same condition of mast cells. Wow, look how much you're learning. To- <laughs> I know, and I thought I knew a fair amount, but obviously I am talking to the expert. So what can women, what would you say the cu- overall cure rate is? I mean, I, I get that each condition is sort of different, but can women basically expect that they can treat pain and get past it? Well, we haven't even gone to many of the other uh, conditions, but le- let's do them right now. Okay. Okay, you can have someone complaining of a bad leg, shooting pain down the leg where it's almost disabling to walk, or uh, you have foot pain and uh, you can't, you can't put pressure on it. Okay. Yeah. And the leg is never the problem. It's uh, a disc in the back. It's the the condition I just brought out to you is called sciatica. Right. And the problem is some herniated disc in the lumbar region, which has really nothing to do with the leg. But the referring pain is coming from the leg. So the brain perceives it as leg, but it's really nothing to do with the leg. So let's argue you can have a genital manifestation of sciatica. You can have pain in your vestibule coming from your pudendal nerve. You can have pain in your vestibule coming from a disc in your back. Wow. Just like your leg. Remember, all of medicine applies to the genitals. <laughs> so we can play the medicine game. Do you figure that out because you've ruled everything else out? Or how That's quickly are you, you looking for their back? Okay. Let me take you on your thought because you're, you're, I'm, I'm going to milk out this answer. Okay. So we have drugs that are called anesthetic agents, right? Lidocaine, benzocaine, tetracaine. They're just different, longer or shorter acting anesthetic agents. An anesthetic agent makes nerves numb. Okay, so if you come in to me and you say, I can't have entrance uh, uh, pain, we say of entrance dyspareunia, and, and you have a belly button that hurts, you can't put a tampon in, and I say to you, well, why don't we map out the borders of the vestibule? So the lateral border has the name heart slide, the medial border has the name hymen, and we just paint anesthetic agents on. And if it's a problem of nerves in the vestibule, then all the pain goes away. Right, right. <laughs> So we can prove it's local to the vestibule. So now a woman comes in and says, my God, I have this horrible burning pain in my vestibule. You know, sometimes it's in my lady. You know, sometimes it's in my thigh and my buttock area. You know, sometimes it's shooting down my leg and my foot. And you say, but it starts in the vestibule. So it's my vestibule and it's sore and I can't have intercourse. And you say, let me numb your vestibule. And, And guess what? The pain's still there. Right, 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 right. And it's really weird to be have a numb tissue that still has pain. I have to tell you, because we see this all the time. But I still can't get used to that whole concept. Yeah, yeah. So you have to look upstream. Right. The next upstream is called the pudendal nerve. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's a nerve that transfers information from the genitals to the spine, called the pudendal nerve. Do you know what pudendal actually means? This is a weird conversation. I, I don't. It's the nerve of shame. Oh, no. Really? Yeah. The pudendal wow. nerve in the woman's genitals is called the nerve of shame. If you go in the, you, if you like understanding the, the how names came about. Uh, uh, yeah. Is it called the, the same thing for men? Yeah. It's called the same thing for men, okay. but the yeah. pudendal nerve, the area of shame. Wow. So uh, uh, now if you find the pudendal nerve and you say, you touch it and she jumps, you say, oh, okay, let's, let's numb the pudendal nerve. So you take your trusty needle You figure out how to do what's called the pudendal nerve block. And she says, my God, I still have pain. You've numbed this and I have pain. You've numbed that and I have pain. So guess where we're going to look? Higher up. Now we're going to look in the lower part of the spine where the lumbar discs are. Yeah. Okay. And we're going to say to a pain specialist who sticks needles in people's backs to do steroid injections for for back pain, we're going to ask that doctor to put lidocaine in the disc area that that is wrong on the MRI. And lo and behold, she's going to say, oh, my God, that's the vestibule I've always wanted. Because the problem has nothing to do with the vestibule. It's in the disc. So we do a spine surgery to fix the vestibule. How do you like that? Isn't that fun? That's crazy. 
Yeah. But it's I, promising you know, too. It's like, yeah. That's the engineering <laughs> of all of this. It's, right. It, listen, people have pain. There's got to be an explanation. It can't just be that some magical power is causing them to have pain. It needs an explanation. Yeah. So you just need somebody willing to put the time and effort to be the detective. Right. So we know the most important thing that a woman could do who has pain is tell the doctor, I have pain. Yeah. And if that doctor can't help them, have the doctor find somebody who thinks who can help them and just keep going up the ladder. I, I think I think the most empowering thing is to say, you know, don't take sitting down someone saying, go to Hawaii and have a glass of wine, it'll get better. Right. Because right. you could say back to the doctor, that wasn't a very smart thing you told me because uh, if you don't know, say you don't know. Right. If you do know, tell me that's what I'm supposed to do. Be empowered. <laughs> exactly. But should they just come see you? Because you see people from all over. Like, I know I've got a colleague. I'm up in Seattle. Um, I've oh, I've recommended you to a couple of people. <laughs> hour and 30 minute flight. It's quick. Right, right. But I mean, people come from all over to see you, right? People. So so uh, I'm going to show you this just for fun. Okay, tell me if you can see it. Yeah. So this is my, oh, those are my tags because our hospital, you got to get a tag to go in. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. Uh, but if you look at a physician, it tells you what I do for a living. Yes. How many tags have you seen that say the profession sexual medicine? Uh, none. Yeah, because, you know, you can go to UCLA, you can go to UCSF, you can go to uh, Seattle place, uh, you can go to any place, uh, uh, you go to Mayo Clinic, they don't have sexual medicine in these places. Yet it's a very important part of medicine. It's the subspecialty of all of medicine that mm -hmm. focuses on the study, diagnosis of treatment of men and women with sexual health problems. Right. So we need more doctors like that. Yeah. Yeah. Because there are, there really aren't enough. <laughs> so. so like gynecologists could specialize in infertility. They don't have to deal with men, women with pain. Gynecologists right. could deliver babies. They don't have to deal with women in pain. And they could say, I, I, you know, uh, uh, I'm not going there. Uh, I don't have, I only have 10 minutes to see you. seems like this is going to take three hours. So yeah. in our office, we have three hour visits. <laughs> wow. So what, what is the prognosis for women generally? Can, can most women expect that there would be treatments for their pain and they could get on the other side of that? The answer is very much yes. Okay. That's good news. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, if we can't find the trigger, and I'm, I'm a big cure guy, I'm not like the Band-Aid guy, but we do have a lot of Band-Aid medicines that are really good uh, for pain. We have gabapentin, pregabalin, we have uh, amitriptyline, we have we have all kinds of cool medicines that, that are pain sort of modifiers. And is there anywhere else, is, is there some sort of website or list where women can go to jump a little bit higher up that list of doctors instead of starting with theirs that knows nothing and they tell them somebody else who knows nothing and, you know... Is there some centralized list? Well, there are groups. There's the National Vulvodynia Association called the NVA. There are, of course, the Vulvodynia, Vestibulodynia sort of support groups where a lot of information is shared. Uh, there is, of course, the International Society of Study of Women's Sexual Health, ISWISH, has patient information. Plus, you can find a provider in your local area who's an ISWISH member. This wish people are generally well-trained in sexual pain. It's a very much a part of the day-to-day -day teaching uh, of this wish. We have lots of, uh, we actually have a full course dedicated to, to women's sexual pain. Yeah, uh, uh, we have a book, When Sex Hurts. Right. <laughs> we just published a book. This is like a few days old. Oh, wow. Female sexual pain disorder. Okay. We're, we're making the second version of When Sex Hurts book. We're in the process of rewriting that. Uh, so there's there's resources. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So would you just say a little bit about your clinic and where people could reach out to you if they, if they are so inspired? So our website is San Diego Sexual Medicine. Read about us. We love sexual medicine. We do men and women. So we had a woman who was complaining of pain and her partner had a bent penis. <laughs> That's right. called Peroni's disease. And we mm -hmm. ended up concluding that it wasn't a problem of the woman. It was more of a problem of the man. So we're in this unique position to, to work with the couple. And uh, we do courtesy calls. We're one of the few people on earth who actually, if someone has a problem, can call us, no obligation. And I'll spend wow. 10 minutes with them and discuss sort of the strategies for them. So I, I, I think the bottom line, <laughs> not that complicated. I really love what I do and I love helping yeah, people. So it's... <laughs> it's, uh, and I'll work to the bitter end to find out what's going on. 
we are lucky to have you in the field and that you and we're lucky got, to you know, have people like, a, like you to to have these <laughs> These issues. But I mean, like, I love that you're sort of like a, a dog with a bone like this. I'm going to figure this out because this pain's, you know, it's so devastating to, to women and to couples. So yeah, it's, I'm very, uh, very thankful. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really cool. So the woman today with the birth control pill had been to many providers. I just showed her her SHBG and I said, are you on birth control? She said, of course. And, and then we, she started bawling. She says, I've been to so many doctors. I'm so angry. How can someone do that? And then she started bawling again when we saw it was uh, hormonally mediated. And I said, all you have to do is take some testosterone. It'll just go away. And she's, anyway, it was a very emotional thing for them. But yeah, I, listen, there are doctors who are specialists in cardiology who do nothing but the passage of electrical information from one, from the atrium to the thing. And they could put wires there and they could do that. Well, why can't we do that in sexual medicine? I just tell you a cute story. We I went to a lecture and there was a doctor who stuck a needle in the ankle of women whose bladders were squeezing a lot, called overactive blood. And okay. he was showing that this stimulation of the tibial nerve was helping their overactive blood. So seven lights went off in my brain. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> and I'm saying, well, overactive bladder, that could be overactive pain in a clitoris, that could be overactive in the uterus or vagina. And we have a very cool way, we have a thing called a shockwave device. So it's an it's a, it's a energy that uh, travels faster than the speed of sound. We used to use it exclusively for kidney stones. I don't know if you ever had a kidney stone. I have not. You can turn a I'm kidney stone into kidney. dust with a shockwave machine. Wow. And it's used for ED, too. So we isn't use it? it for ED. So that's why we yeah. have it. But I can okay. put it to help women with various reasons to use it. But I'm using the shockwave now on the same nerve that that other doctor using in women who have unwanted pain syndrome. So we had a woman in the office yesterday. So she fell as a child on a jungle gym right onto her clitoris. Wow. And from being a child, she's in her 30s now. She has had pain in her clothes. She can't let anyone touch it. She can't wear tight clothing, always skirts, often without underwear. She can't touch it. So we took the shockwave device. I said, you're lying down. I took the shockwave <laughs> device to her ankle, and she put her finger on her clitoris for really one of the first times because we block all the stuff coming into the brain through the clitoris when we, because the tibial nerve has the same roots ostensibly as the clitoris. It's S2 yeah. and S3. Well, you needed to know that little fact, but you know, I know why you're so jovial and happy because you're experiencing miracles with people every day. What seems like miracles to them, I mean, to you, I know it's a, it's an engineering problem and a science problem. It all makes sense, but you are you are transforming people's lives every single day. Well, you know, a lot of people are transforming. Let's say we're just one of them, and we're yeah. very excited to do that in a way that other people need to do in a broader scale. We need to have such right. medical doctors in every state not just yeah. uh, the one in san diego but anyway right we're, we're getting there one one day at a time <laughs> well thank you so so much for taking the time thank to you. talk I to really us i really appreciate it and i hope uh, hope you learned you did very well on my testing by the way <laughs> <laughs> well good <laughs> good well thank you all right so uh we're gonna say goodbye yes all right well, thank yes. you so much have a great rest of your day you too bye-bye bye-bye You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advanced access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. 
And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.